welcome to Allen's Italy. Tonight we have with us uh, a very special guest returning with us tonight is Professor Eve Dombra. Eve, welcome Thank once you. again. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and we're going to be talking about a topic which you had indicated to me will be called Roman Portraits and Female Beauty. We'll get on to that topic in just a moment. Right now, I'd like to uh, just say that um, yesterday, uh, my photographer, Laura Gurton, and I were in Poughkeepsie for the dedication and the opening ceremony for Frank Pelaya's uh, mural that he just created for the town. It's on uh, a building right in the, right in the uh, middle of Little Italy, and it's a very beautiful piece. And there was a ceremony, and it was really wonderful, and I wanted to start out by congratulating Frank on that. Okay, so tonight we are going to be starting. Give me a moment to focus in on this. So this is the topic, and I'd like to begin, first of all, Eve, if I might, because I forgot to do this last time, to talk a little, if you could just talk a little bit about your background, uh, you know, how you wound up at Vassar and how you became interested in ancient Roman history. Well, I'm an art historian, and as a college student, I studied literature and art history generally. I think um, it was a love of Italy, traveling in Italy, something you will understand. My parents traveled in Italy, and I thought in, in choosing art history classes, that it would be the Italian Renaissance. So I started there with Italian Renaissance art, painting courses in art history, and somehow, I'm not sure, I read, just fell into books about the Etruscans, so then ancient Italy I became imaginatively involved with, and, um, and then it was the Romans, I think, because on trips to Rome, I visited the Colosseum, I saw the massive structures, the remains of walls, palaces, the houses at Pompeii, um, and I was interested in the remains of that civilization, not just in Rome, but across Europe, North Africa, you know, that imperial might and how they held power by building cities, baths, you know, forms of entertainment. However, I didn't go on, I did my graduate work at UCLA in art history and at Yale University, and at one point I wanted to do Roman architecture, but I was discouraged from it. I was told I probably needed to be an architect or an engineering degree. Um, so then uh, my fallback was Roman art, particularly sculpture and portrait sculpture. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, so yeah. You, you gave up on the Italian Renaissance. Oh my goodness. Uh, well, I'm still interested in it, but <laughs> it's not my are. professional interest. I know you are. So. Well, that's... <clears throat> but I worked backwards in history. Okay, so tonight we are talking about um, and this is, you know, something that you suggested, uh, Roman portraits, and you decided to call it Roman portraits and female beauty. So could you explain that title a little bit? Well, um, the Romans um, have developed portraiture, and it's usually thought to a greater extent than the Greeks. Right? In terms of um, original contributions, the Romans are known for their architecture, their engineering skills, the aqueducts, the baths, the Colosseums, you know, those huge urban structures. In art, you know, the traditional way of thinking is the Greeks led, right, into styles of classical art, Romans followed. And clearly Romans imitated or borrowed or made their own Greek sculptural types, particularly sculptures of the gods. But in terms of portraits of emperors, distinguished individuals, um, and ordinary people, this is one of the ways that Romans um, made a contribution to the history of art. In, it's a, a generalization, but many of the portraits of the ancient Greeks that preceded the Romans are rather idealized, like stereotypical. They have smooth, idealized feature, gen, uh, features, excuse me, generally youthful. Um, they look like gods, like their Aphrodite Apollo. Not entirely, and there are phases of Hellenistic portraiture, um, Alexander the Great that looked quite distinct. But the Romans um, had a penchant for representing their leaders, their emperors, their generals, warts and all. all right. They didn't try to beautify them. 
which seemed to be more of a tendency of the Greeks. So we say the realistic portrait um, is a, a, a feature uh, or a contribution of the Romans. So um, most, gen most studies, particularly when I was younger in graduate school, school um, look to the imperial elite, the reigning emperor, you know, those men who we know in history, Augustus, Nero, Hadrian, um, and there are coins labeled, you can see miniature portraits in relief. Um, and so the study of Roman portraits becomes a, you know, a handmaid into Roman history. Who was powerful, um, you know, the battles, the accom political accomplishments. Um, you know, with feminism, 60s, 70s, and so on, I became, I was not the first, there were other scholars before me, but I became interested in portraits of women and children, not only the wives and daughters of emperors, but those who could not make any mark in the historical record, um, mm -hmm. who couldn't play a role. Women were not political players. They couldn't serve in the military. They were the wives of citizens, right? The political, uh, the women of the political elite could work behind the scenes influence if they could at all. And it's interesting that in terms of the spectrum of social classes, those um, you might say in the middle or middling classes, those who worked for a living, carpenters, bakers, their slaves who they may have freed to become freedmen, they have portraits. We see these named, inscribed, funerary reliefs and altars. So in Roman portraiture, you not only see those at the very top of society, but you see those who are only known because there's a portrait with a name, a label, now, an inscription. Why did they choose portrait busts instead of um, paintings? Because they weren't doing paintings at the time, well, weren't they? I think we can look a little bit. Um, the problem is that there would, were wooden panel paintings, but mm -hmm. they're ephemeral. And caustics. Yeah, we don't, we'll, we'll look at there's some painted panels from mummies in Roman Egypt, Egypt in the Roman period, but those are not left. What lasts are portrait busts, busts that have some of the neck and shoulders, full length figures with portrait heads, um, and these were made of marble. Bronze was the high technology of the day, more expensive, and these were placed in tombs, often a, a commemorative portrait of a good wife and mother, like the one you have on the screen. Mm -hmm. the, some of these, if you were a local grandee, a man who had given money to his town to restore the aqueduct or to you know, help poor children or to rebuild roads, you may have a portrait sculpture in the town forum. You are honored by your citizens for your generosity. And you know, that Roman society um, was built on that kind of the, of the elite giving their money, donating to yes. keep the city yes. running. That was a very important part of it. So um, you were, you know, portrait sculpture provide examples of those who were not just famous or glorious, but those who were civic leaders, right? Who felt a duty and obligation. Yes. Yeah. As I said, even in the cemeteries and roads leading, and, and the cemeteries were on the roads outside of Rome towns. You would also see smaller, more humble tombs and monuments to midwives, bakers, you know. So mm -hmm. this impulse to represent yourself, to create a memory, right? so that other generations, those who can, would know your name, your face, what you did for a living, seemed to percolate down Roman society, from the emperor to the, those in humble processions. If we move to the next sure. slide, we, we will get to female beauty, right? because um, as I said, you know, the private life of women is observable in these, it can be observed in their portraits. But this image on the screen, and here you have, um, it's a wonderful starting point. It's a full length portrait statue in marble from late first century BC, now in a museum in Rome, and the figure in a toga, right, the kind of Roman business suit, lined, somewhat lined head. What is he doing? He's holding two Roman portrait busts, right? So it's mm. interesting, it shows it shows again, he's clutching them, right? And you can see each of them, they're men, they are portrait busts, a head, neck, a little bit of shoulders and chest, right? One of them is standing on a kind of proper support, that's the thing that looks trunk-like, that helps the statue stand up. And um, note that our, the, the, full, the man that's holding the bus looks, what, 
sort of middle age. There are marks, lines, some wrinkles, but you might think particularly the head um, that he's carrying toward his right looks slightly older with receding hairlines. So this gives us, again, why would you be toting around two heavy portrait busts? Are they made of terracotta? Some scholars have thought, could they be wax masks? We have a Greek historian who tells us about the Roman funeral of political leaders and dignitaries. And in the first century BC and before, in the city of Rome, if you were a general, a statesman, someone who made history a big name, your body was carried to the Roman Forum and there was a procession of all your family and particularly your younger male relatives would don wax masks, mm. some say death masks, of ancestors. Right? Mm. So it would be as if all the younger, the surviving members of the generation would be in costume, in masquerade, of those who had preceded the death, the deceased to the grave. So it would be a kind of historical pageant. These would be the names that you would, we would know um, from historical sources of those who had fought for Rome, expanded the empire around the Mediterranean basin, you know, um, who had created um, the political structure that we know as Rome. So we'd have this huge pageant to send off the most recent um, member to the grave. Were all um, Roman corpses cremated? Um, um, no, what we see early, on, the, the um, death ritual changes. Cremation early on, and then by second century AD, about the time of the Emperor Hadrian, mm -hmm. um, they begin to enter the bodies mm -hmm. in coffins, and the coffins are marble boxes that are carved in relief called sarcophagi, and you'll right. see many of these mm -hmm. in museums, and they have mythological scenes and so on. But um, the idea that um, we're not sure if one would tote the portrait busts around, but wax mask effigies. Do of we the know deceased. who these people are? Here? No, here no, we, we have no know. inscription, okay. but it's thought to um, look back to this patrician ritual of honoring your deceased forebears, of mm -hmm. almost worshiping ancestors. We also know another historian, Pliny, tells us that in the house, the townhouse of Roman elite, there'd be a shrine with ancestor images if not these wax death masks, then portrait busts. And some houses even had painted on the walls family trees, right? So the idea, and of course, if this was Cicero or the general Scipio, Scipio Aemilianus, you know, those who, who conquered big swathes of territory for Rome, the private shrine is a kind of history museum in the house, right? So history was always before them. And if some of these, um, statues were in public in the Roman Forum or in the Forum of Pompeii and other towns, these figures were supposed to cast good examples of proper behavior, of um, accomplishment, right, of dignity. These were the high achievers of their period. So others would, young men and others, would look up to them. Shall I move on? Sure, okay. sure. Tell me so note, um, in the, the Republican period, as we just saw, you might say, and, and this divides Roman portraiture from Greek, the heads we just saw looked like middle-aged men, sunken cheeks, lines around their eyes, crow's feet around the jaw, somewhat flabby necks, balding, receding hairlines, if you will. Right? The Romans didn't shrink from representing age. This is alien to our culture. You might ask why. Well, for the first in the first century BC, the period of Julius Caesar, Cicero, right when Rome was becoming an empire, uh, those who ruled were older. We may say elderly. You had to, the Roman political system is one in which you had to move up a series of offices. Right, the young didn't immediately claim power get attention, right? It took time to raise an army, to move through this system. So age was venerated, the ways of our ancestors. However, this all changes at the very end, towards the end of the first century BC with the figure of Augustus, whom we now see. Mm -hmm. This is a very famous marble statue. It's the Augustus of Prima Porta. Prima Porta was where it's found, a area outside of Rome, and it was at the villa of Augustus's wife, Livia. 
It's thought to be perhaps a copy of another statue like this that was placed in public because it was found in a private villa. But it shows the Emperor Augustus, my grandnephew of Julius Caesar. Augustus is considered first emperor because he changed the political system. Um, and what do we see? If you look at his head, note the bangs across the forehead. Uh, the hairstyle is very important. Right? We identify portraits of Augustus, Augustus through those bangs across the forehead. They're slightly, point, um, the, the, they have a kind of pincer type lock over his right eye. Um, and that distinguishes him. And all of, uh, I think this is very um, captivating about Roman portraits. You look at that, you can immediately recognize any portrait of Augustus. They all look the same, mm -hmm. right? So they're standardized. We're not quite sure. There must have been a huge imperial workshop to make heads or models and send them out to Rome and Spain, France, North Africa, and so on. But that being said, look at Augustus. If you can remember the portrait statue we just saw, he's young, right? Beautiful, radiant. So, um, so, and so this is a change, right? And this gives you a sense of the political use of portraitures, that he is shown young and Augustus is shown this way throughout his career when he is no longer young, right? He stays young in portraiture. So this is, the, this is political, right? A part of the political use of imagery. So why is he shown as this, you know, note high cheekbones, firm flesh, straight nose, almond-shaped eyes, maybe slightly smallish, close set, smooth, broad chin, right? Nothing, nothing um, smooth, regular features. Well, the Greeks um, showed themselves like this in an idealized, mm -hmm. regular, so with very symmetrical features with no marks of irregularity, no lines that show experience or age, the test of time. So was Augustus looking to the Greek model um, it, it, the Romans looked, learned from Greek culture, literature, the higher arts, intellectual activities, and that model was always before them. Um, before this, Julius Caesar and others turned away from the Hellenic model. We know that in other areas of the arts, um, Augustus used Greek art styles, the styles of 5th century Athens, Phidias and the Parthenon, to show that his period of Augustus, uh, the Augustan period, was one of cultural renewal and high the golden age, like fifth century Athens. Mm -hmm. So again, political choice. We also know, though, reality. Augustus was a very young man when he marched in Rome. He owes everything to Julius Caesar, including his name. So he um, was a maverick. He changed things. He wasn't these toothless, graying, wrinkled general, right, who worked his way up the ladder of various political offices. He grabbed power. He went in there. So in some sense, it reflects reality that, you know, he was a young upstart that, you know, those like Cicero could not believe that this, you know, this young guy was doing what he did and was being so successful, right? Mark Antony got shocked, worked with Caesar, it fell apart, you know, was done in by him and Cleopatra didn't quite understand what, you know, didn't take him seriously until it was too late. Um, so he was a superb uh, military uh, in terms how, of- How did he become that way? Was he trained? By Julius Caesar in any way when he was a teenager? Or hard to say. Hard to know if they had that much. He just. It was just. He chose his time. We don't. You know, it's hard to say. We don't really know. So in image, he stays youthful, right? He is youthful, um, and it's thought there's a civil war. Mark Antony, Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. So this youthful, radiant image after the civil war of Ro Italian or Roman fighting Roman is one of, um, you know, a new start a new age you know, that looks back to Greece, but is particularly Roman. And if we look at the portrait body, um, he's wearing a military breastplate. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's molded, modeled to his chest, but note there are figures in relief that refer to past battles. And note too, if you look at his legs and arms, he's heavily muscled. He also looks back to a famous Greek statue, and it's by no coincidence that it's from fifth century, right? About the time of, um, not far from the Parthenon. So again, it may reflect his youth, but it also shows different cultural aspirations and a turning point in Roman society. So the portrait of an emperor you know, carries this political ba baggage. And we could move to the next. Sure. Um, this is a, a portrait bust, right? Head, a little bit of a neck. It would be on a, a stand. You quite 
can't quite see that. And this is Augustus's wife, the first lady of Rome, Livia. And Livia too is, does not seem to age, right? There's some variation. And these would be political images because they would be distributed around the empire. And she looks rather youthful, smooth-cheeked. There's some damage to her nose, large eyes, well-lidded, heavy lids, full lips. Um, so nothing quite distinct about it. And if you looked at books of Greek art, um, heads of goddesses, it looks sort of like that. What's distinct about her, and we will follow this up in um, the later images we look at, is the hairstyle. The one thing that would tell you this is not a, a, not a, a Greek mythological image or goddess is the hairstyle. No, it's parted and it looks like she has the hair up to the sides or pulled back, but on top there's a kind of roll or a large um, parted section that's pulled back. And that's distinctly used uh, more by Livia and other ladies of this Republic late first century BC. So she is not, and, and those who've studied the portraiture of Livia point out she does not look like Cleopatra. She does not look like Greek or Hellenistic queens, right? It's a particularly Roman hairstyle, one that's not. What, is there any purpose to that kind of like over Roll, um, and the little... hair would be, the longer hair, she would have Did longer. Did she create this style? Well, no, it's interesting, no. And you see, she was such a prominent woman, there are other, other portrait heads of women we can't identify. Um, they may be wealthy women, wives of other Roman senators. We don't know, but they're wearing this hairstyle. So she blends in. She's not standing apart, mm -hmm. although you may say she's the first lady of Rome. And others have pointed out that, that you know, it, in the kind of semiotics of hair care or grooming, it, you know, the hair is parted, swept back. It's, she actually has long hair, you can't see it, and in the back it's wound up into a little knot, sometimes tightly braided or a ponytail. So this is hair under control, right? And we know that Augustus, a military leader, a man who made, remade the Roman Republic, cha sweeping changes in political structure, also um, implemented laws of moral reform. He wanted to keep women chaste, right? And there were rather laws that looked to the private lives of the citizens, particularly the elite, the senatorial class. So the idea that the hair was controlled, moderated, um, kind of severely parted, you know, kept back, is thought to you know, have make sense with um, Augustus's idea of keeping women in their place, in their home, right? bringing Roman citizens, young soldiers, right? into the world. Was she his partner? I mean, were, were they well, really like, uh, uh, kind of like the Clintons? Well, the Hillary? Um, there, there are uh, different points of view to us. There are some historical sources, some that are not hostile to Augustus and Emperor that said she had too much control, that she meddled, mm -hmm. that she influenced mm -hmm. him. You know, that's a refrain throughout society. She, was a, um, she did um, what other wives of emperors did is that um, she was active in religious life, right? And Roman women could take part in public mm -hmm. life if they had money by donations to temples, um, festivals, and all of that. Think of like, you know, women, um, elite women do charity balls and functions and things like that, donations. Religious, religious world gave them an outlet in society. And she also had patrons in various towns. I mean, she also patronized, I mean, towns or provinces, um, so she did have a sphere of influence. And if we move on. Okay, sure. Um, I, this is um, one side of a coin, right? A coin of the realm, money that you would keep in a little purse or pocket if you had one. And what we have on coins are um, images, small, tiny images in relief of emperors and also the women in their family. This is Agrippina. So it's early first century A.D. Um, after Don't Ag tell me, um, Claudius. Well, these are right. The women, yes. Of, yes, of the emperors that follow wives and daughters of Augustus, and um, well, Augustus ha had trouble um, finding heirs, so he had to adopt a son of Livia by her previous marriage, Tiberius. So um, the, the next generation dynasty is called Julio-Claudian from Livia. 
Claudian and um, Julius through Julius Caesar. So um, I just wanted to show you the uh, coin because you can see that a coin is labeled to the left. We yes, see Agrippina yes. and then we see various titles. So it allows you to give at least a rough date to reign. And there you have an image. What is that saying around there? Um, well, it says Agrippina and then it oh, gives uh -huh. you um, Caesar Augustus. So it gives you a sense of oh, oh, um, right. uh -huh. general yes. reign. But yes. note um, profile view, right? In yes. relief. And note hairstyle. All right, so here, there the hairstyle is more loosely arranged. There's a large curl, like a corkscrew curl coming down behind her ear. The hair is pushed in the back. And she doesn't show signs of age, right? That very straight nose, large eyes, lips, simplified features. So in some ways, like Livia, we don't see much change. But you can see that the coins, which are scattered on, in archaeological layers, found in the ground, you know, in foundations of homes, when you excavate, these allowed scholars to match portrait heads, figures, busts, and have a, you know, a, an identifying label. And we can move on. Um, here, this is uh, uh, my title piece for beauty. This is a portrait that dates to the 90s AD, so the end of the first century AD, after Libya, Libya, uh, Libya um, Claudius, right, mm -hmm, Nero. Mm -hmm. This is the second dynasty of Rome called the Flavians, and this is interesting because this is a beautifully rendered marble portrait about life size, note the long neck. It's inserted, you can see a little bit of the so uh, shoulders and drapery, but um, it's inserted in a portrait bust that's of later date. Head is tilted, there are feathery eyebrows, there's a little damage to the nose, but look at the beautiful lips, the fine carving of the cheeks. You can see a chiseled bone structure. And then that fabulous hair, you could say this is big hair. So this hairstyle defines this period of the Flavians that's an 80s or 90s AD, the end of the first century, named after Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian are the emperors, and Flavian is a family name. And what you have on top, it's very different from the pristine or regulated hairstyle of Livia or even Agrippina. We have a kind of wreath of curls, right, um, of tight ringlets um, framing her hair like a ring, wreath or a crest. And if we could see behind it, the rest of her hair is tightly braided. She'd have long hair, and it would be pulled back and arranged in a kind of bun or chignon. But she has this huge kind of frontispiece, like a fan of curls. So it completely gives her height, right? You know, um, and it doesn't show that kind of love of control and ri rigidity, as you can see. The curls look like they're springing out. Now, what's interesting about this, who is this woman, right? Yes, was this portrait thinking. bust was not found with a label. There are coins that show us the wives and daughters or nieces of Domitian or Titus, these emperors from the end of the first century. She doesn't quite look like any of them. They may share her hairstyle, but that's not enough. Um, so previous art historians, previously art historians have said, oh, it's got to be wife of Titus, daughter of Domitian. Doesn't look like them at all. So she could be a private citizen anonymous, a wife of a senator. And um, it's interesting, some would say because it's so exquisitely carved, look at the passage of the brows, you know, the part of the nose that's not restored, the cheeks, that it has to be someone important or rich, but not necessarily so. Mm. We've seen other portraits and we look at them, are those that were ex-slaves, freed men or women. They could be freed by the master, their owner. Um, because of their skills, their business acumen. Mm -hmm. Romans did this, Greeks did it. So Romans had a kind of um, social mobility. And in Roman law, slaves were tools, things. You know, an owner could molest, abuse, kill a slave. Right? The slave had no legal authority, right? Even less than a pet in our uh, today's society. So um, I, I'm not sure, the quality sculpture doesn't, it, it's hard to say um, that this has to be of an elite, an upper class person. And you know, art historians, archaeologists want to give a name, right? We especially want a historical name, we want to know something yes, about the yes. biography. But um, she remains nameless. She's, mm. you know, she's not of the imperial elite. And I think we have another detail of now her. Now, the, um, yes. the hair 
is sculpted so magnificently. Yes. I mean, that must have taken a very long time. Right. And this, if you visit it, this is given pride of Where, place. It's in the Capitoline Museum. Oh, Rome. is it? Oh, is it? Yes. As you go okay. upstairs in yes. the ancient galleries, yes. there's several halls the of sculpture. The one on the left. Yeah, the one on the left. Uh -huh. And it's placed by a window, backlit, you know. Oh. It's beautiful. And a uh, drill. And look at them. You can see dark it's amazing. in the circles. It's magnificent. And they seem to have a kind of, you know, springiness texture. It looks coiled. incredibly realistic. Yeah, they're about like they're going to fall out of her head. Um, scholars have wondered, uh, this it seems to be the hairstyle of the period. The imperial women oh, have oh. it. But this is higher and more intricate than the mm -hmm. ones of wife of Domitian and daughter of the Emperor Titus. Mm -hmm. So who is she? You know, you would think that the imperial ladies would And they have no idea who she is. We don't know. And then yeah. some, there's um, one scholar has tried to replicate one scholar of classics who is also has some training in um, hairstyling has tried to um, replicate these hairstyles and she says you can do it because um, we used to think oh is it wigs and we know Romans have wigs poets like Marshall tell us satirists that Roman women's wanted light German hair and they bought wigs however um, you could have it could be a, a kind of hair piece some, or you could have backing of something stiff like a leather band to keep those up because it's just a sheer vertical fan of curls or instead of gel, beeswax, ancient sources tell us, writers, or um, this one scholar who also does hairstyling say you can use beeswax, you could do back combing and teasing and they found in archaeological sites women's grooming kits in which they were large needles, not needles for sewing their tunics or garments. Mm. You could um, keep the curls together in place with um, kind of needle and thread and maybe a kind of leather stiff backing. Mm. Right? So you know, not impossible to do, although you know it requires good posture and a slow right, aristocratic gait to wear something Should like I, that on I your head. Up? Yes, move on, okay. please. A little softer focus. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't think we have a profile view, but you would see the hair is steep, nothing much behind it. The rest of the hair is gathered in tight braids that um, um, is kept close to the head and pulled in a little bun behind. But, you know, a beauty. And it's interesting, again, we don't know who she is, and it doesn't seem she's at the pinnacle of society. Um, yes. This is one that brings in the ex-slaves or freed women. Again, this is in a museum in Copenhagen, the Carlsberg Glyptotek, but it came from Rome. Okay. And it came from the countryside outside of Rome, one of the roads um, in which there are many tombs um, lining the roads. Uh, again, scholars would like to say she is a wife, a sister of the emperor. Um, probably not, we don't know that. Doesn't quite look like them. And what I like about this woman is look, she's like dressed from the head up. No, she has a variety of the hairstyle that we just saw. Um, that is, she has that poof of tight little ringlets or curls, but you can see in this version, they're not individually sculpted with that full, um, with the curls drooping down, you know, with the kind of corkscrewing effect that we saw before. It looks like she has a big bonnet and those, um, the drilling of the little holes would be the center of the ringlets. The rest of the hair pulled tight behind. If you look closely at her face, she um, has some wrinkles or lines, right? Looseless, looseness under chin. Yes. The li lines between lines flaring out, marks of age from her nose to her jaw, a little softness under the eyes. So beyond that first bloom of youth, I'm not sure if we'd say middle age, and then she's nude. Right? Now we do know that Romans did not allow their good wives and mothers to be shown nude. Right? Modesty was very important. Think of Livia with her hair clamped down and parted. Mm -hmm. Right, This would be out of the question for a woman to be seen nude. However, the pose, one hand at breast, the broken hand would be at her Why genitals. only one hand? Why, well, why is she covering her right breast? Well, she's covering breasts, and the other hand that is now missing is uh, would have been placed towards her genitals. Oh, I see. right? I see. And, um, so it's a mismasquerade. The body is not her own. Mm. It is Venus, the Greek Aphrodite or Venus, the goddess of love or sexuality. And in fact, this would be recognized because the body is a well-known sculptural type of Venus. So interesting. And mm -hmm. it was made all of one piece. So an individualized mm. portrait head 
of a woman of some middle age wearing a, a hairstyle contemporary to the 80s or 90s AD, right, a version of which we just saw, trendy hairstyle. But her body, again, is not her own. They appropriated or used a famous sculptural type, mm. right? So it's, and if this, we think it's in a tomb, you're honoring her as a good wife, a mother, that she is so beautiful as Venus, or as fertile as the goddess Venus, right? There are many acts, aspects of the goddess Venus, right? A very energetic and aggressive sexuality, if you know your ancient myth, that would not be at all appropriate to the good, devout, chaste Roman matron, but the Romans sort of put that aside. It's also important that Venus was the goddess that protected Julius Caesar, right, and Augustus, so she has political cachet too. Right? But the kind of uneasy sexuality, right, aggressive sexuality in Greek myth is gone. And if you look closely at the bottom, do you see two little feet there next to her? You see that right there? On the right side. Yeah, there are two little feet. What is that? Well, missing from it, it's broken, it's right, would be two little feet of a little cupid uh -huh. or eros, uh -huh. right? next to her, right, the arrow holder yes. child uh -huh. of, so it was a mythological group, but again, this gives you a sense of the Roman creativity or inventiveness. Some would say, oh, well, they just copied. They took a body from a Creek statue and put, you know, the mother's or the wife's head on it to compare her to the beautiful, voluptuous Venus. It was very common to copy, for the Romans to copy Greek sculptures. Right, and you know, some say, did they copy, did they emulate? Did they make it their own? Did they change here? They now, how did they actually well, they, they see them? Did they, did they go to Greece? Did they, well, were they brought back? In those wars of imperial expansion by the late second, you know, Greece was conquered, was a province of Rome. Mm -hmm. Young men like Augustus went to Greece for study abroad, right? Like we send students to London, Paris, and other parts of the world. Um, so yes, earlier generals brought boatloads of Greek sculpture home as booty mm -hmm. of war. It was mm -hmm. displayed in public in Rome and private. Then they had sculpture made. Greek sculptors were brought back as prisoners of war, mm -hmm. second and first century. Wor worked for Roman generals, right? This was common. So um, yes, they knew the Greek art. They appreciated it. It was one of the finer things in life. But here, I, what I like about this, did they respect Greek art? Yes, but they completely redid it. Right, ahead of a woman showing some signs of age with her co contemporary hairstyle, right? The head of Venus mm -hmm. is completely bland, youthful, large eyes and nose, and her hair is just swept back, sometimes a knot, a, a large loop above, but that is, you know, the hairstyle. That was also very common of the Romans to copy uh, Greek sculptures but then add their own little touch, right? Right, that kind of... right, right. So yeah, they made it their own. And yes, here, you know, yes, exactly. And, and so it would be... And other cultures as well. Yeah, it would be unthinkable for a Greek mm -hmm. to put an individualized head on a, a body type of a goddess, Aphrodite, you know, to okay. commemorate. So, um, so myth mythology is alive. You use it to adorn, to give an identity to a woman who is, oh, she is nameless. Again, we don't know who she is. Mm -hmm. And my other point is that there are other comparisons of these, of um, that statues like these, here I don't have, an, we don't have an inscription or enough of an archeological context to figure out name or the social rank of this woman or her family, but some others like these, the subjects of these statues were ex-slaves. <coughs> Excuse me, freed women which are kind of interesting, right? And some say, well, the w emperor's wives or daughters would never be shown nude. Not sure, there are some, uh, you know, but maybe these freed, wet, freed wet women or freed men, excuse me, um, were a little, could be franker, could be more inventive, right? We're not that restricted in this way. So we see this. Take a swig, yes, should I move you. on? Oh yes, go ahead. Oh. So portraits, painting, and color, you asked me before, yes. where because of the dryness of the sands, the desert in Egypt, in Roman Egypt, right? August, Emperor Augustus took Roman Egypt as a province um, after Cleopatra VII and Mark Antony were defeated at the Battle of Actium, 51 BC. So um, Egypt is ruled by Rome, a special province. And in this period, we see what are called the Fayum portraits, paint panels, 
They're called Fayum portraits because many of them were found in an oasis area of Fayum. However, it's wrong. They're found really throughout of Roman Egypt. And what you see on the right in detail, often painted on a wood board, right, with encaustic paint, pigments in wax, highly adorned. And then on the left, you see it's inserted on top in a mummy. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So the mummy would be often shrouded in linen. Here a beautiful casing with you know some parts of the actual bone structure and other things placed in it. So the um, these people these those who were honored or commemorate this way, interesting. You know, it's an Egyptian ritual, an Egyptian way of preserving the dead. You can see the Egyptian gods, Horus, and figures on the mummy casing. Um, if there are inscriptions, and there's some here giving names, they're in Greek. Why? Because after Alexander the Great, Cleopatra's family, the Ptolemies, they were Greeks. You know, Alexander the Great um, divvied up his empire, so the ruling class spoke Greek. Right? Um, so Greek language, Egyptian death ritual uh, culture, but um, the portraits look very much like colored, painted, sculptural portraits. And the same kind of jewelry, we see the same hairstyles. Um, I think if you move to, next slide please. Yeah, um, that's a, that would be. I can make that larger. Yes, so could you that? please. Yeah. Right. If you think of some of the portraits that we saw of, um, not quite Livia, but of Agrippina with the loose curls, that was the first coin we saw. We saw it from a profile, but Agrippina in early first century AD had loose curls from a center part. It's similar to that, right? The jewelry, note earrings, um, necklace we found in excavated sites at Rome, Pompeii, etc. There you get, you know, color, shade, red, blush, um, a heavy face. Right? Um, this we see in, in sculptures. What's interesting, there was an exhibition at the British Museum, Ancient Faces, maybe I'm not sure, 10, 12 years ago, um, and they looked at not only the mummy portraits, but sometimes, you know, the mummy portraits are in context of the actual mummy in which there's a bone structure. So they compared. And it's interesting. They found that what was left of the bone structure inside, you know, the mummy would conform generally to the painted portrait, which is interesting because you asked before, did Augustus really look like that? Well, no, I said he didn't stay young all the time. But often for the sculptures of emperors, we don't have, you know, the DNA, we don't have the bones, we don't have, you know, the, their actual bodies, so, you know, we just have the art. Here we have some of the, uh, you know, actual structure of, you know, remains. The, the paintings the to me are interesting because you're actually getting a chance to see the color of her hair. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and the color of her dress, a little purplish, I mean, is that? Yeah, yeah, they're bright the... colors, and there are others of these, you know, we could have added more, brilliant colors, and often lots of jewelry, lots of yes, gold. Yes. Are they, you know, and did they own, you know, in art, right? You can lie, you can make yourself more beautiful, more grand. You know, did they own that much jewelry or do you want to show that on your mummy, you know, um, your image right. for eternity? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, some of the other forensic specialists at the British Museum also looked and they found when they compared mummy portraits to bone structure, they found that the artists did take liberties to improve the looks of some of the subjects. That is, some of the faces would be a little thinner, bone structure a little finer than what they would think from what was left of the, the skulls. Right? You know, if you can make a projection, a drawing of soft tissue based on the skull that was left. So some attempt to beautify them. Right? We found in the Republican portraits of men, you know, they looked old, hardened, grave, you know, Elderly, that was, the Romans did not um, shun that. That was, you know, their pride of, you know, having experiences of climbing to the top. But for females, some um, slimming and beautification. Yeah, this is, um, uh, this involved, this is a, an ivory doll. And I'm interested in this in my current research project. As you can see, I'm interested in portraits, portraits of women, unnamed portraits, private portraits, you know, those on different social levels. This is, um, it's about this big, an ivory doll. Mm. It looks dark because it was found in a wet grave 
um, in the Tiber, near the Tiber in Rome. Um, it was found in a sarcophagus with a, a, a skeleton of a girl. It looked mm. like the girl was cradling her doll. They, we think the girl was about 17 years old, buried in a marble sarcophagus with another one. There was another man, member of her family. There was a tomb there now. It was washed away by um, the changing currents of the Tiber. And the girl's name inscribed on the sarcophagus is Creperea Trifina. And the date is about um, mid, to, um, third, mid to late second century AD. Right? So um, um, probably the reign of Antonius Pius. And what you see here in this doll is that it's a jointed doll. Right? So you could move mm -hmm. arms, you can see the legs bent. Um, and note the hairstyle is one we didn't look at. It's a little late second century. Um, she has waves around her face. The hair is braided, and then there's a large turban-like structure um, piled on her head. That is also a hairstyle that the emperor's wives, Faustina, wears at this period, right? like the high pile of curls we saw from the late first century. Remember, this is later second century AD, um, not quite a century later. So we see imperial hairstyle. The face and the doll, I think it looks sort of like a Barbie doll, right? Big lips, yes, yes. Just small petite nose. I don't large, know much about Barbie dolls. But, but you recognize them. Um, yeah. it's, it's not. There's no marks of age. It's not distinguished, kind of idealized, heart-shaped face. And then look at the body. Uh, again, like a Barbie doll. It's not a baby doll. She has breasts, right, hips, a figure. What's interesting about the figure, it's kind of high-waisted. And that conforms to the kind of tunics they wore, right? So if you think of your well, Barbie, this is the doll of a seventeen-year-old. Yeah, well, it, it's well, not, it, not the doll of a, of a of a seventy-year-old, right? No, well, and she might have accompanied her through her life, and mm. accompanied her to her grave. That's fascinating, right? As a best friend. Antoninus and Faustina, isn't aren't, aren't, isn't that temple in the Roman form? Yes, yes, and we looked at that a few weeks ago. Yes, uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So it, she's wearing the hairstyle of that period, and furthermore. In the sarcophagus, the coffin of the girl holding the doll, there was also a box of beauty accessories hmm. that were owned by the doll, not the girl. Owned by the doll? Yes, because they were tiny. There was a little box, and it has tiny silver mirrors um, and tiny little um, combs for her hair, although you can't really comb her hair, it's solid. And furthermore, you can't see it in my image, but the doll had a little ring with a key on her finger to open her little private box of adornments mm. within the box that held the skeleton of the girl and the doll. Wow. So um, it's movable. Was this a doll to teach a Roman girl how to drape your tunic and mantle your cloak? Right? Did the doll and the girl look in the little silver mirrors to give her practice? I mean, girls play dress, dress up with Barbie. They also play many different games that are not just about right, how you look um, today. Did they then? I mean, interesting. And I love it. It's, so it's a, it's, a, it's a tiny mini portrait, but it moves. I mean, it needs the girl's hands to be activated because we think of those marble busts, right, uh, as not moving, although we started the, the hour with a man holding them, right, mm -hmm. clutching mm -hmm. a marble bust. Uh, you know, the Fayum painted panels were placed on top of the the mummified body, you know, clearly not moving, no animation. But there is a sense that this is kind of interactive, right? You see in the bent knee, yes, right? We don't think of fine art, you know, on its pedestal. Children have them. always been children, and they probably yeah. had the same, you know, play habits right. as our children mm -hmm. do, really. Very interesting, really wonderful. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, that, let's go... Mm, yeah. Yeah. Where, where to? Tell me I what. Keep know. going? Let's go through those. Okay, keep going. Keep yeah. going. Tell me when to stop. Yeah. Um, I see, yeah. This is, yeah, keep going, one more. Keep going. Yeah, I think th this is a kind of... Four minutes. Okay. okay. Here, here I just wanted to look at, here's a classic portrait bust. What is the bust? Where we see it in later times. Head neck, shoulders, a little bit of a tunic, a garment. Mm -hmm. And then do you see the there's a stand, right? Yes, with two yes, moldings. Uh -huh. And in between the end of the chest and the stand, <coughs> there's that little plaque is where the inscription should go. Uh -huh. They're not, not finished. 
And there you have again that hairstyle with the piles of ringlets, that Flavian style, late first century. Right? Um, there it's slightly peaked. We saw it on the beautiful bust in the capital line in which there were corkscrew curls. Just another one which shows you how popular that hairstyle was. At the same time, mm -hmm. we have to think how difficult it was to have those pile of curls you know, mm. on your head. And imagine walking and moving with something like that. In fact, um, the satirist, the poet Juvenal says, you know, I saw a woman with these hairstyle, tears and stories on her head. From the back, she looked small, petite, but from mm. the front, you know, she looked, <laughs> you know, monumental. Right. So it's kind of a joke about, you know, what these women did. They kind right. of changed. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So the hair, you could say, is <clears throat> transformational, you know, sort of like a mask. I, I think of these hair, whether they were hair pieces or I see sewn with leather backing to keep them in place as a kind of, you know, um, Sunday best or uniform dress for matrons of women of good standing. Clearly a woman had to have hairstylists, slaves, hair pieces. It took sure, time yeah, to get into this. Although those <clears throat> who were shown in portraiture might not have really looked like this in life, you know, maybe That's, once or twice, yeah. but mm -hmm. in art you can project that. I, I think about it like women in the 40s or 50s always wore hats outside, you know, yes, jackets and yes, hats, yes, earlier uh -huh, generations. Yes. If you were respectable, you always went out with hats or gloves, uh -huh. um, something like that, because uh, I could show you many more of this, and this is the style from the Flavian late first century, but there are tons of we're women out of time with those hairstyles. Unfortunately, okay. we are out of time, but first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for being here. It's... Um, it's wonderful for my viewing audience. To me, it's a privilege and a tremendous amount of fun. I love this stuff. And I'd like to extend to you an invitation. You have an open invitation oh. anytime you would like, even if we have somebody else oh. who's scheduled <laughs> to be on the show, like maybe Frank Palaya, we will insert you oh. and he can move to a different time. Only kidding, because I, I, I cherish his contributions as well. Thank but you. But you have an open invitation and we'd love for you to come back and uh, um, thank you very much for watching to my audience. And uh, buona notte e buona fortuna. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Right there, you five minutes. I was sort of at the end, so I was trying to look at. I didn't want to go to something new. Oh. Are we off? Uh... Yeah. Okay. <laughs>